Uh, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Wes Gray. After serving as a captain in the United States Marine Corps, Dr. Gray earned a PhD and worked as a finance professor at Drexel University. Dr. Gray's interest in bridging the research gap between academia and industry led him to found Alpha Architect, an asset management firm that de delivers affordable active exposures for tax sensitive investors. Dr. Gray has published four books and a number of academic articles. He's a regular contributor to multiple industry outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, and the CFA Institute. He earned an MD MBA and a PhD from the University of Chicago and graduated magna cum laude from, with a bachelor from the Wharton School at UPenn. Wes currently resides in the suburbs of Philadelphia with his wife and three kids. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. All right, so the subject of today's talk is actually a rebuttal to Gary's. It was, were people in uh, Gary's talk, Antonacci's beforehand? So this would be a great compliment to what Gary was talking about, because this is kind of the counterpoints to a lot of the things he was mentioning. And what we're going to talk about is, is basically momentum, just high level, what is it? Um, two, try to understand why can an open secret potentially be an open secret and still work. So, so a lot of this talk will revolve around that kind of central idea. So first off, if the thing actually would work, what are we talking about when we're talking about momentum? Because as Gary highlighted, momentum can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, like where do you apply it, how do you apply it, et cetera. What we're talking about is the most basic momentum, often called cross-sectional momentum, applied in the context of stocks. How does it work? Well, the most simple version of this is your x axis here is time. Let's say this is 12 months. And then over here is basically your cumulative return. So if the, we had two stocks in the universe of all the stocks out there, a momentum strategy at this point in time would simply ask the question, who are the winners and who are the losers? Or who has relative strength? That's what it's always been called until they changed it to being called momentum and confused everyone. And so a momentum strategy would say A is relatively stronger than B. Therefore, we're going to buy, e, buy A and either not buy B or sell B. Now, what's interesting about relative strength strategies is let's say that these charts were shifted down this way. And let's say stock A was ne down negative 10 and stock B was down negative 50. We would still consider stock A attractive not because it's absolutely good on a momentum basis, but it has strong relative strength, right? So simple momentum strategies that we're going to discuss, this is the basic idea, just so we make sure we're all on the same page about uh, what we're talking about here. OK, so if you go back to the efficient market hypothesis, including this guy here who's basically got the Nobel Prize for effectively doing all the studies on it, a central premise of that hypothesis, especially in its weakest form, is the weak form efficient mark hypothesis, which simply states that we can't use past price information to predict future price information. And yet, momentum is a strategy that purports to do exactly that. That is pretty much the biggest black eye you could possibly get for the efficient mark hypothesis. And so the original idea was, well, let's just deny, deny, deny that it even exists. But even now, the people that won the Nobel Prize for this, Eugene Fama, and his co-author on a lot of these empirical studies, uh, Ken French, they won't even deny the simple empirical fact that momentum, what we're talking about here, stock selection momentum, is in the data and it, quote unquote, works. Right. So people no longer go down this line of logic or argument anymore. It's just a fact. Now everyone goes down this line of logic, which is the Gary Antonacci logic, which is a fair one to bring up. And this is the question, OK, we know that it quote unquote works on paper, but does it work in reality? Is it super ca capacity constrained? Is it too crowded so it won't work anymore in the future? And then more importantly, how can something that everybody knows about, I'm sure everyone in this room knows about momentum or is taught about it, how can this continue to work in the future? So these are important questions that we actually can ask and maybe get some interesting insight on. So the first one is on capacity. So as Gary highlighted, there's a ton of academic research which basically highlights 
that momentum is super capital constrained. And I, you know, I talk about all the different papers, all the same ones that Gary talks about. And essentially, what's the bottom line? Bottom line is momentum maxes out on capacity around $5 billion. And the important thing to note is all of these studies essentially use the same sort of technique. They leverage what they call tech data, which, is simply, which essentially reflects the experience of the average trader trading in financial markets. Doesn't say anything about the marginal institutional trader that's actually trying to arbitrage or exploit these anomalies. It just talks about the average experience. And the data just is a, it's just an empirical fact. $5 billion, depending on which way you cut the model, that seems to be the capacity using the approach that academic researchers have leveraged in the past. Great. And then you get the rebuttal, and we'll talk about the details, but first from BlackRock. They're like, well, this is the issue. You guys use TAC data. We don't trade like TAC data. We're not taking market impact. We're using algorithms. We're trying to be smarter about how we deploy our capital. We're not going through you know, wholesaling our, our uh, orders like Schwab does and selling the Citadel and getting fleeced. Like We're better than you. And, so let's, and we're also a little bit smarter about estimating real impact costs, because we have a heck of a lot of real trading data, and we can tune that to our actual in-house model, which every day we get a test out of sample to see does our estimated you know, pre-trade impact costs actually mat, like match what our, our real trading was. And they say, hey, using our real data, piped through a model that we maintain internally that's used trillions of dollars of actual live transactions, we think that momentum has a capacity that is a magnitude larger, right? The academics said five billion, they say a lot more than that. And this is if you just did it in one day, right? If you did it over three to five days because you want to spread out your impact, obviously you magnify it. Main point is there's massive disagreement from BlackRock using actual transaction data as implemented by their traders and using their own impact models. Okay, that's interesting. AQR, another huge institutional trader that actually trades a lot in momentum. They've done it for 15, 20 years. They have a trillion dollars of actual live transaction data, again, where they get very clean insight on implement, implementation shortfall, where they have the trade they want to do and the quantity they want to do it and the price they submit it to the market at, and they know exactly what their fills are. So they have very clean data on estimating what the real no kidding, practical implementation cost was to implement the strategy, and they can build models and systems to try to estimate that what they think is the capacity for momentum. And similar to BlackRock, they think it's a magnitude larger than what the academics say. Academics basically say $5 billion, practitioners say 50 or more. Great. So we have, we have a problem here though, right? So we have the academics who are sitting in an ivory tower, and in one sense they're not conflicted because they're just academics doing research, but in some sense they're very conflicted. Because the, if you've ever been in academics or ever went to get your PhD, especially in Chicago, the whole world is the efficient market hypothesis. So anything that is biased towards convincing us to believe in that hypothesis tends to get the benefit of the doubt. So in some sense, when we can publish a paper that says that the biggest black eye on the planet Earth to the efficient mark hypothesis is just not true because it's just frictional cost intensive, you can't actually do it, it's not real, they might have a bias, right? Similarly, obviously AQR and BlackRock have a massive bias in conflict as well. They sell products that does this stuff. So arguably, they want to convince everyone that this has infinite scale because you should pay them to go do this so you can, they can make you money or whatever, right? So everyone is conflicted here, and it's really difficult to get to the bottom line. But the AQR guys, I think, do a really genius experiment. They say, let's, let's not try to be too clever here. Let's figure out, let's use the academic models. Let's use live transaction models. And let's see how expensive it would be to trade the entire market. In one case, they say, let's look at, and unfortunately, wide room, so I'll just walk you through it. But in this chart, which none of you can probably see, 
they basically say, how much would it actually cost to trade the value weight crisp index? Which if you guys don't know, that's essentially the value, it's the market cap of every NICE, Amex, and NASDAQ stock in the entire crisp database. It has, it has very minimal turnover, but it has some turnover because stocks go in and stocks go out. Well, according to TAC data, just trading the market would cost you f over 5% a year, which means according to this data, the beta equity premium doesn't exist after transaction costs. So anyone buying an SP500 Vanguard fund is basically wasting their time. They should have just put it in cash. That doesn't make any sense. If you use live transaction data estimates to conduct the same exact analysis, it goes to around 40 basis points. Much more realistic. It means there actually is a real beta premium, also a factor, just like value or momentum. That seems more realistic. What about the S&P 500? Valuate Crisp is not necessarily a tradable index in its purest form. The SP 500 is a very tradable index in its current form because there's $8 trillion traded on it. Well, let's see here, and again, you guys can't see it, so I'll just walk you through it. But if you use the approach of TAC data, what the academics do, it costs you 140 basis points, apparently, to just own the S&P, even though it has like less than 1% turnover in every year. Probably not very realistic. However, if you use the data from the people who actually do this stuff, they estimate it at around six basis points. Who's right? Well, we can go to the SEC filings of both iShares and Vanguard and identify what their real cost of implementation is for the SB500 index. And guess what? It's way closer to six basis points than 160. It's around 10 bips. So clearly, the academic model is a, I would say, a less credible estimate of how institutional traders actually deploy capital in the marketplace and what their actual transaction costs are, whereas the data from BlackRock and AQR are much closer to reality because we can benchmark this against the S&P 500, where, there, where we don't have to argue about value, momentum, or whiz-bang XYZ factor, right? So, I would argue based on just this very fact here and kind of just a sniff test, reality check, that the estimates of capacity on these value and momentum and all these anomalies are probably closer to those estimated in practitioner or, or uh, papers that are based on practitioner live data versus TAC data that is used in academic papers. Certainly constrained, but more towards 50 billion, not 5 billion. Great. But it still could be the case, let's say that capacity is 200 billion or 500 billion. You could still have the argument that there's so much crowding into this quote unquote momentum factor that it's still gonna blow up the trade, right? Well, we can actually go to the marketplace and see what's going on. Right, so everyone's saying right now, well, there's so many momentum funds, there's so many ETFs doing these factors, like they're just destroying the momentum names because they're pumping so much capital into that place. But remember, for every buyer, there's a thing called a seller, right? And so here's a great paper that came out from Blitz recently where he looks at just, WML is just the winners minus loser beta, basically like the momentum factor. And he can look at exposures of every single new smart beta fund out there. And you notice there's not, there is, there's basically insignificant from zero. For every momentum fund out there, there's someone else that's implicitly or explicitly doing non-momentum factor. So on net, there is, there's been no, shift in like a massive move towards momentum. And interesting enough, all those funds that have the highest momentum factor and the lowest momentum factor have nothing to do with momentum, which is also just highlights the point that the market is a lot bigger than a few quant geeks trading momentum, right? So if you look here, the biggest momentum funds are sector funds, REITs, home construction, home builders, biotech, Vanguard utilities, again, the biggest negative momentum funds are, again, sector funds. So all the capital is getting swashed around in these sort of things that are actually, if you want to argue momentum's dead, you got to argue somehow sector funds are taking it away, which they're not, right? So there's no clear evidence 
that there's this influx of massive crowding and multiple hundreds of billions of dollars focused on momentum factor. It's just not empirically backed, at least not in the, in the ETF space. Maybe there's you know, a trillion dollar institution out there that's private that doesn't disclose what they're doing and they're pure momentum, which wouldn't be captured here. But it's certainly not the case that ETFs are somehow arbitraging away momentum. Now, what's even more interesting is this is a new technology we've actually built in-house. This looks, and I'll have to explain this, it's called Visual Active Share. What we have plotted on here is these dots, the, the bluish ones represent MTUM, the iShares Momentum Factor Fund. Should be arguably the most hardcore momentum fund out there because it's called the Momentum Factor Fund, right? The two dimensions that are plotted here, this dimension is the 212 momentum, the classic momentum characteristic. This dimension right here is market capitalization. This runs from zero to 100 percentile. And what these dots reflect is the actual holdings. So every holding, this holding right here, happens to be in the, around, what is that, the 65th percentile on momentum and around the, whoop, the 55th percentile on size. So that's kind of a mid-cap blah stock, right? Now, if, if someone was doing the momentum factor as discussed in academic research and discussed in all these frictional cost studies, well, they're going to own what we call momentum stocks, right? They should be sitting right here. You should have a, mat this is the top 20 percentile based on just generic 212 momentum. And you should see a huge gob of stocks from MTUM just piled right in here. If they were doing the momentum factor, and if it was independent of size, you would see them kind of scattered along this dimension. But what do you see as the dominant characteristic for MTUM? And SPY is also on here. Nothing to do with momentum. In fact, the distribution of these dots right here have basically no correlation with the momentum characteristic. They have an epic correlation with the size characteristic, right? This is the 85th percentile and higher market cap. So what this is, is the MTUM fund is basically, if anything, trying to arbitrage the size factor. It is not trying to arbitrage the momentum factor really whatsoever, right? So even if there are things out there that are called momentum, we got to ask, how much capital is actually being deployed into actual momentum stocks versus what the marketplace is perceiving as potentially being momentum, and essentially it's just another size factor, right? And so we have this tool now where if people, they can basically call out what characteristics are actually being owned in their fund, and you'll find it remarkable because I'd say about 95% of funds don't actually do what they say, and they're not actually exploiting any factor they may have like a very small tilt because they're trying to minimize tracking error to like the SPY, but it's not the case, I don't think, that we have a massive crowding problem because people are using the words factor, the word momentum, because one, none of the funds actually have any significant loading to it, and, one, and also none of the funds are even called momentum that have those loadings, and the very fund that says they're doing momentum isn't even doing momentum. Right, so it's just, it doesn't make any sense. However, a lot of times what people do is they cite, well, look at the performance of the momentum factor. Here it is, Jagadish and Tim in 93, you know, people were a little bit delayed, they, they read the research, they're like, oh, momentum, this is like a straight up arbitrage opportunity. We're gonna get all this great profit, and look what happens. The trade is dead. There's machine learning people. There's QuantCon conferences. It's just, you know, this is over. All the hedge funds and Rentech are going crazy. Computers blew up the trade. You know what happened? That happened in the Civil War, too, in 1849. Here we were. All the soldiers were on the field. They said, you know what? This momentum factor, it has backtest the last 30 years. We're going to deploy our sticks and our tools and our amazing, like, I don't even know, paper and, and, and you know, pencil to map out the dots and charts, and we're going to blow up the momentum factor. 
right? Okay, and that's happened maybe World War I. Maybe it's a war effect, right? Civil War, World War I, World War II. You know, we had the Iraq War, which I got to hang out in, and the, you know, the Gulf War. Maybe it's just a war effect, right? This argument and this narrative that technology has destroyed momentum or value in these factors, you'd have to then explain why technology destroyed the factor in all the other periods, right? I mean, it, it just, the, that narrative doesn't hold up just by proof by counterexample, right? It could be the case, but let's get serious and understand why open secret factors work. They work because they suck. There's higher fundamental risks. These are typically your proxies for real risk. And in equilibrium, real risk needs to earn higher expected return, or we really got a market efficiency problem. And the other thing is they got to be associated with extremely painful arbitrage costs. Guarantee 0.72 will never fund anyone at Quantopian that proposes a momentum type strategy as the type that we talk about. Why? Because if you try to lever up a 212 momentum factor fund, you will get extinguished so fast and die of bankruptcy, it won't even be funny, right? So these strategies that are really, really hard to arbitrage and build three to four sharp ratios on are not gonna be arbitraged by Millennium, SAC, DE, Shaw. That's not their business. They're an information acquisition game faster than everyone else. When you talk about the open secret anomalies, they work for a reason. They're usually some element of risk, and there may be a mispricing in there, but it's very, very expensive and painful to try to arbitrage it away. So a lot of capital, unless it's got a 20-year horizon is kind of crazy, is not going to stick to it. And the bottom line is, you can back test till your brain explodes, but if you can't identify the pain, there ain't no gain, right? There's got to be some implicit pain in order to get gain. That's how market equilibriums work in a competitive marketplace. Now, that pain may not necessarily be something that drops out of a macroequilibrium factor model that's based on you know, returns to be somehow related to consumption or whatever. It may be irrational pain, like you hate getting fired by your, you know, your investors, and there's career risk, but that might be a price risk premium as well. And that, that could be associated with the value or a momentum, right? So another argument people always give us is, well, that's great because you're just using 212 momentum. That's like some generic crap in a journal that was written 30 years ago. Um, we're going to do fancier momentum, right? Well, OK, so we've back tested probably, I don't know, 100 papers and every engineered idea you could ever imagine in your life. We wrote, Jack and I wrote a whole book dedicated to this. And we came up with what we thought was the fanciest way that's also robust to express generic 212 momentum strategy, right? And what do you see? Well, let me explain what this is. This is a histogram where this is zero. These are positive values. These are negative values. This is the frequency of observation. And these are five-year rolling relative performance measures. So why is momentum cool? Well. Most of the mass is positive. So over any five-year period, you, you're doing what you wanted to do. You wanted to provide excess performance. However, there is a over a 10% chance, probably 11, 12 mass right here, where over a five-year period, you underperform the S&P 500. And this is what the fanciest thing we could come up with where we felt confident it wasn't driven by you know, an element of data mining, which it certainly could be. Right? So even the fanciest thing out there that we could devise after looking at every scheme on the planet Earth, it goes back to, is it st it's still got to be painful for probably a fundamental reason, and other people will never want to do this because they're not insane. Right? If you can't answer those two questions, you don't know who's on the other side of your trade, and you don't understand why you're going to be making money. And, and it's just kind of how the markets work. So. Bottom line is just momentum has capacity. Momentum is a good strategy, but momentum is a painful equilibrium like, outcome in the financial marketplace. And it's worked in the past, and I put a lot of money on that over the next 100 years it's going to work in the future. Unless risk preferences change. For some reason, human beings just 
don't mind the risk that's attributed with as much, or arbitrage costs come way down. So if there is a mispricing, you know, the big prop shops can lever up 10x and like take advantage of simple things that immediately get realized. And it's almost like they can submit to get the NAV every day, which if that ever happens on momentum, you know, God bless them. So anyways, that's kind of a sobering thing, but I'll leave you guys with my magic trick here. And whoever gets this right, and under, this is a quantity thing, I'm gonna show you guys with these cards, I can read your mind, and whoever can write me and tell me how this is solved, I'll give them a free signed book of quantitative value. So, Sabati, I know this guy, full disclosure, John, come on up here. I want you guys to figure this out. We had a math PhD uh, that visited us about a, I don't know, a month and a half ago, and he finally figured it out, but it took him about a week. Um, I still don't know how it works. That's why I asked math PhDs. All right, John, so here's what I want you to do. Pick a number between zero and 60 and show it to the crowd. Like, you know, like if it's 15 or whatever. I don't want to see it. Zero and 60. Okay, does everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, John, what I want you to do is on these six cards, tell me which cards contain your number. Okay, so two, three, five, and six contain your number. Let me try to read your mind here, man. Read your mind. All right, let me look here. Hmm. Ah, let's see here. No, that's not it. That's 15. Got it. All right, all right. So if, I, I promise he's not a plant. Henry. <laughs> You're not a plant. Let's try it again. He could be a plant because I work for this guy. Henry, come on up here. Let's, let's do another one. So you guys, and may, and maybe you can try to figure it out, the mechanics of how this is working. So tell the crowd. I'm going to make sure I don't look. Tell them what you got. So between 1 to 60 there. All right, has everyone got it? All right, Henry. So look at these cards and tell me which cards have your number. Two, three, and six contain your number. This is all, this is all SEC capital guys. Probably mad at me for, for talking trash about him, right? All right, two, three, and six. I'm going to say 11. All right, all right. So you guys try to figure out my magic trick. My daughter, actually, my seven year old daughter got this in a magic kit, but uh, whoever sends me an email and tells me the uh, reason why this works and the me mechanism how it works, I'll mail you a free copy of uh, Quantitative Momentum signed. So anyways, any, uh, any questions on momentum, capacity, constraints, you know, how it may or may not work, any of these sort of things? You guys are an easy crowd. Yes, sir. Right here? No, sorry. It was like this. Right here. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yep, I'll orient you. My bad. So what it has here on the x axis is what they call the WML beta or UMD beta. Winners minus it's the mar it's the momentum factor, right? So this is and on the y axis here is the assets under management and every single one of these dots represents a smart beta ETF, right? And so what this shows is these, this is the universe of all these smart beta ETFs and their respective momentum loadings. And if the argument is that all, all of a sudden there's all these funds that are moving into momentum or this momentum factor, we should see some sort of tilt. You know, and if it was really bad, it would be the big guys that have huge momentum tilt. That would suggest, at least you know, from a data standpoint, that there seems to be a lot of capital moving into high beta, and it's doing it with a ton of money, because this is also like a log scale. Um, but what you notice, and I don't show like the T stats or everything, because, well, you probably can't even see that, right? <laughs> I should have just did big muscle movement pictures here. But it, it, you don't see any of that, and there's really no significant tilt at all towards momentum at least amongst all these new ETFs and factors, and because the, the argument is like, these guys are just doing value and momentum, and they're like killing everything. 
I, I would say that arguably the only factor that's getting potentially overcrowded right now is this factor called the little bit of momentum mega cap size factor called SP 500 stocks, right? In the beta factor. So that's where all, like if you were, to, that thing has a ton of capacity, but arguably if you're worried about crowding and you think about how marketplaces work, and I, I'm a big Vanguard fan and everything, but you, if you saw that, you'd see beta massive size, like insane amounts of capital going towards that. And so maybe you start to question, well, do we got crowding out and capacity issues and just raw beta and, and the mega cap factor? I don't know, you know? I don't think the sharp equilibrium really applies because most people buying and holding today are not buying and holding. They're buying, which has massive impacts, like Vanguard's trading desk is perpetual bid. They don't get that bid for free. They pay when they do it, and, and there's tons of money doing it. And at the same time, those people are probably selling their active, which tend to have different betas than S&P does. So I mean, in equilibrium, you know, there's clearly not a factor load into momentum. And they talk about all the different factors. Maybe value's got a small tilt, I don't know. But I think this, what he shows in his paper is that this idea that there's this massive crowding into these targeted factors is just not true. And what this highlights is all the quote unquote factor funds are bullshit. They're not actually doing factors. They're doing more S&P beta size loadings. So every fund that says it's a factor, if you really look through on its characteristics, it should be in the, the factor characteristics where they, that's what factors are all about, is loading on a characteristic, but they don't. So as Gary talked about, there's 700 funds called that have the word value in them. Well, what this tool shows, and I think a lot of data show, just because you have the word on a product doesn't mean that's what the product does, right? And, and that's kind of the lesson of financial services, is this is 99% marketing 1% actual content, you know, or 1% actually doing something, um, which, which yeah, that's actually why Quantopian is kind of cool, because it's like, like these people are 99% doing something, uh, 1%, they're not, they're not marketing it because they've got one buyer who's funding it, you know, and, and so it's, but the rest of the real business, as you guys probably know, it's a marketing shtick. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so we gotta watch your incentives now. And, and so over time, as you become more of like a marketing thing, we just would admit, we'll have to look at whenever you guys purport to have some certain characteristics or whatever, we're just gonna make sure we call you out. And, and, and maybe you're good. If you're marketing and you're selling what you say you're selling, that's a good thing. If you're marketing and you're not doing what you're, you say you're doing, that would be arguably a, maybe not a bad thing, but a transparency issue. Yes, sir. Yeah. Can you mention that slide with the stock and the SLG? Uh, yeah. Just on like generic momentum. Yeah. yeah. Is, is the word global economy better? Like if more people are looking at the same signal and more, more funds bought stock A and bought stock B, would it be better? Like why is it why? Why? Well, you're right. So, so in, well, in theory, is if it got too over, like what would happen is how would you get massive negative performance on the momentum factor? Is the problem is, and, and again, I, this is just the theory, is everyone buys too much of A, everyone short sells too much of B, eventually fundamental events are realized and people are like, oh crap, and then, then you lose the return, right? Um, and, so that, that, and that's the argument of why it's had a bad 10 year run. Right? It's because, oh, people, they paid way too much, they, they short sold way too much, fundamentals were realized, and then you know, expectations were resolved, and that's why you realize the bad returns. Now what's interesting though, and this goes back to what actually is capacity. Well, if you think about it, if, if let's, it's actually really exciting to me if I see factors, which I know are painful and work for a reason, being marketed to people as if there's some godsend, right? Like when, when, I, when I see people selling value or selling momentum and I know the mass, these are 10 year 
zero, like you can get your face ripped off doing this stuff, right? And if you don't recognize that and you're being sold these products, you're not buying these products, inevitably when none of these things work over maybe an extended year period, you're all in and you're now the natural seller on these things. And guess who's gonna extract the long-term risk premium on these things? The smart, not I won't call it smart money, the whack job money that has so much discipline, it's insane. Because if they, if a lot of money goes in, but it's not forever horizon money that holds through that whole premium cycle, it'll actually just increase the volatility and arguably the expectation of the premium that goes to the person that can hold the pain train better, right? And, and you know, I think one, like a good way you can maybe empirically analyze that is you look at like DFA. So DFA has, does book to market primarily, and they have, if you've ever talked to DFA advisor, they are 20 year horizon like a religious cult. Like the people in those strategies, you have to beat them over the head to make them sell it. That is really permanent capital that's now been deployed in massive size, $500 billion, into the book to market anomaly. That's how you arbitrage anomalies. There's still a risk premium, so value will still probably work at the margin out of sample, but if there was any sort of high arbitrage costs or high arbitrage risk and elements of mispricing, arguably DFA has shot themselves in the foot by coupling massive capital that is insanely disciplined that can actually earn the premium and now has probably shrunk it at the margin. Um, but I, I would say that most providers you know, are not interested in that. In, in, it's just too difficult to find the long money in any sort of size, so it's, it's gonna be difficult to get even hit the capacity constraints um, at the margin. But, but that's how these things would leave. S tons of smart money, insanely disciplined, sticking through thick or thin, because they'll slowly decrease the, the risk premium and, and any mispricing premiums out there. Yes, sir? Yeah. And um, I was wondering that there are actually two notions for market interest. Yeah. One is the realized market interest, and another is expected. Market yeah. And so academics probably tell you it's expected, so that they simply go to the author book, estimating each second how much it costs. Exactly. Amount, yeah. And practitioners tell you it's a non transactional data. Yeah. Yeah, don't submit open, yeah, market orders in the morning. Uh, <laughs> massive size. I, I totally agree, but the only way you could prove that to the academics is you gotta get better data to prove your point, and that's kind of what they've done, basically. And, and I think your intuition is correct, but sometimes in order to convince someone of something, you need to bring your own data to bear to just show them definitively, hey guys, I actually do this, <laughs> and you can have your expected impact models and all your theories, and you could do whatever you want, but now we have data where we can reconcile this and actually determine who's quote unquote right. And, and yeah, you're, and that's what they basically said, essentially. Um, but sometimes you just need data, because that, that world works on kind of like, okay, that's a great hypothesis, Makes sense, show me with your data. And that's what they've done. So, but yeah, very good point. Yes, sir. Last oh, sorry, last question. My question is if you are a retailer, this one here. If you're a retailer, it's a mutual investor. Yeah. And they have a lot of funds, they're looking for a momentum factor. Yeah. And a lot of funds are effectively beta plus. Yeah. Well, you should probably, if, you're, if you want to own the premium, like you really want momentum, you need to just ascertain what is basically the cost for that little active piece, right? And, and to the extent that you're buying like a fund that's 99% beta, 1% what you actually want, and it costs 50 basis points, well, we know that the opportunity cost for the 99% is basically zero. It's called a Vanguard fund. So we could say, I'm paying 50 bips, for 1% of what they actually want, that's 5% effective fee, right? Whereas, and, and maybe that's what you wanna do, maybe it's not, but if I can access that active piece in a much more fee efficient way, then I would wanna do that, 
right? So, so yeah, so you, you just, if you're gonna do factor investing and you really understand why, <clears throat> sorry, you wanna own the factor, you just you know, ascertain what factors you wanna own and you just wanna get kind of the best deal for the, for the piece, the active piece you're actually buying. So, so arguably, you'd rather pay more for a fund that's very concentrated on what you actually want as opposed to paying a lot less for a fund that is essentially replicating what Vanguard's already given you for free. Um, yeah, so yeah, and that's kind of what our business focuses on is, is trying to deliver the pure like crack cocaine version of the factors. And they're more expensive than obviously Vanguard, but you only need like a small dosage to get what you need. You don't need to, to pay 40 bips for the smart beta. You can buy 99% Vanguard and just like a little of the crack because um, it's like much pure drug basically. Um, and there, there's concepts, you guys probably know them, but like active fee, uh, active share, like active, sh active fee is a way to kind of break out what's, what you're really paying for the activeness of this fund. And it's not perfect, but it's a way to try to identify this. Um, but, and of course, the reason the market's moved towards this method is it's a lot easier to say, hey, buy the value fund, 20 bips, man. And they got a trillion dollar scalable overpriced S&P fund, basically. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And they're selling to the wrong people. Um, okay, I th think we got to. Thank you very much. Yeah.